Right, so last week, Friday, we went over what's regarded as a simple example, but if we go with traditional ways, this example already gets hard. You know, it was the example of there's a prize or two goats between three doors. Um, a priority, you don't know what the price is, so all doors have equal probability. You choose one door, doesn't matter what the number is, the numbers here are relevant. You choose door A, door 2 or door 3. In this example, you, the label was 1. You choose door 1, and by you I mean the contestant. The contestant chooses door 1, the host opens another door. Before the host opens another door, the contestant can already reason that the host will play adversarial. If the price is behind door one, the host can either open doors two or three. If the price is behind door three, the host will open door two. And if the price is behind door two, the host will open door three. So, so we can we have the probabilistic model which consists of the prior and the likelihood beforehand. Then, then the host goes and opens the door, and the question is, do you believe the price is behind door two now, or door one? Okay. And we answered those questions by doing Bayesian inference, and I did this on the board because my pen failed, and so I've included this on the slides, and the slides are now aligned with this exact material. So if you didn't take notes, you have notes now. And so, the pro so we basically compute now what's the probability that the prize might be between door one, even that you observed someone opening door, the host opening door three. And we do that for the hypothesis, you believe that it might be behind door three, and we did it for the belief that it might be behind door three uh, as well. But obviously you already know that if there was a god behind door three, there's no price there. But nonetheless, I did the exercise so that you would see you would get a zero confirming uh, intuition. And then we compute them all. And I mentioned in the last step, when we were just plugging the numbers, that because I know that P of D equal 3 is whatever normalizes this to sum to 1, it must be true that this guy here, P of D equal 3, is just the normalizing factor. I've added a slide where I argue for it. What I discuss, first of all, I introduce the definition that, uh, of marginalization. Okay, so if you sum of this conditional distribution over all the possible values it could take, you get 1 by the rules of probability. And that's essentially what I used to normalize. An alternative way, which I didn't do, but you could do it, and it's another way to think about it. It's a bit more work, uh, but if you're a bit shaky with still learning the concept, it's probably best to play it safe. And thus, you just write an expression for P of D equal 3. Okay, so P of D equal 3, it's the marginal of P of H and D equal 3. Okay, because we don't know what H is, so we need to sum over all the possible values that H could take. That's marginalization. We then do conditioning. We write it in this form as P of D equal 3 given HI times P of H equal I. Now we have P of H equal I and we have P of D 3 given H I from the definition of the problem. So this is, this is P of H equal 1, 2 and 3. And we have the probabilities of P of, P of D equal 3 given H1, H2 and H3. So we have everything. The next is we just plug in numbers. And here I've expanded this to just make it very clear. You plug in numbers, and what you get is exactly what we had in the previous way of working through. 1 6 plus 1 third plus 0, which is what we had so that things would add up to 1. Okay, so there's two ways to do this. Um, I suggest you go over the slides and um, carefully go over them. Um, finally, I left you with an exercise. And the exercise was to compute the expected utility. 
I have not defined what expectation is. I assume if you have the prerequisites for this course, you know what an expectation is. I will describe what expectation is next week in more detail, so I will define it. But it's essentially it's sort of a weighted average. You sum the utilities or the rewards for something weighted by their probability. Or you sum the losses weighted by their probability. Okay. So asking someone, I don't know, for the guys in the audience, going and asking Uma Thurman, sending an email to Uma Thurman today or to Facebook or whichever way you want to creep on Uma Thurman uh, for a date is something that has very high utility maybe for a lot of us, but uh, not my wife not watching this. <laughs> um, it has high utility, but you, you know, the probability is very unlikely. Okay, so if you weight the utility by the probabilities, you probably would not bother to ask Uma Thurman for a date. Alright, so and that's essentially the principle. And we looked at that example, and I asked you to plug in some numbers and do the computation. Now, someone said, oh, but this is not how we make decisions. Um, it turns out that this explains a lot of the decisions we make. And people, uh, one of the things that was mentioned at the end of last class is like it's not all about the money. There's lives involved and so on. And no, everything has been factored into that reward model. The fact that it's about lives and so on, it's captured by those numbers. You might not agree with those numbers, but uh, you know, if, if a hospital has to make decisions and spread welfare, it will have to come up with such a table. And that's how decisions will be made. Um, maximum expected utility is also known as best response in game theory. Um, how many of you have seen game theory before? Okay, so for those of you, um, what each agent must do in order to maximize their own utility is to do maximum expected utility, to do best as possible. If, if you do that, if each agent does that, you reach an equilibrium, and that's called a Nash equilibrium. Okay, if we all act according to this, we will reach equilibrium. Um, the criticisms are still not things that we can grasp with the problems we've introduced so far. But to sort of give you a taste of it, um, there is a sum involved here. You need to sum over all the possible things that could happen. As we will see, that sum becomes quickly intractable. It becomes exponential. Something that's called the curse of dimensionality. And that's going to be the topic of today's class how things get badly, really badly, and how we try to get around the sort of exponential increase in computation. Any questions about last class before we start with the new one? So the last few classes last week, they were all about giving you the background how to do conditioning, how to do marginalization, what you need in order to be able to manipulate probability. Once you have base rule, conditioning, marginalization, the rest is really easy and it's fun and it's basically applications of this. And that's what this week is going to be about. I'm going to define something very cool called beta networks or also known as probabilistic graphical models. And we'll see how to use them for inference on Wednesday and, and finally, on Friday, we'll look at, um, we'll start, uh, I mean, over the next few lectures next week, Friday, we'll start looking at the problem of learning these automatically from data. All right, um, actually, before, let's get started.
So, in this lecture, I hope that to illustrate the concept of the curse of dimensionality and probabilistic inference, so that you get a taste for how hard things get quickly and to the science. Uh, we'll define what a probabilistic graphical model is, or also known as a Bayesian network. And it's known as a Bayesian network mainly because you often use Bayes rule to do the manipulations that are needed. Um, we're going to talk about a new concept, conditional independence. So far we've talked about independence. It turns out that independence is actually it's okay, the like coin flips are independent and so on. But if you want to talk about very interesting variables in the world, conditional independence turns out to be a much more powerful concept. And finally, we're going to, going to cover a bunch of applications from um, environmental statistics to fashion and so on. Okay, so what's this course of dimensionality? Yeah, that one always dies for some reason. It's on the time. I'm going to try this strategy. I'm going to switch it off at the beginning of the class and switch it on. Because <laughs> maybe we'll let the time move on as they have both. But um, anyway, so let's assume that we have the binary variables. And for now, we'll use binary variables, but it's not a restrictive assumption. I'm only using binary because it makes it clear to explain. But everything actually applies to variables that can take more than two values. If we have d binary variables, let's assume that we want to represent their joint. And let's start with an example. Let's take e equal 3. And let's assume that our three variables are the a, b, c, a, b, and c. So we have three variables a, b, and c. Each of these variables can take values 0 or 1. If that's the case, in order to represent the probability of A being equal to 0, B equal 0, and C equal 0, I need one number which is just essentially the probability of that event happening. But I will also have the event 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0, and 0, 1, 1, and 1, 0, 0, and so on. And that will allow me to represent all the other probabilities. For example, v of a equals 0, and b equals 0, and c equals 1, and so on. So in this case, how many rows do I need? How many numbers do I need to fully characterize the probability? 8. Eight. Eight. Actually, can I optimize that? Do I need 8? 17. Um, right? Because... Let's make a minor refinement here. And... Uh, sorry, actually, by that I need this. Um, and the minor refinement comes from the fact that probability sums to 1. So you always know what the last value is. The last value has to be whatever it is that when added to the previous seven values will give you one. Let's go back to our box example with the three balls. And I'm going to use that example to introduce notation. So typically, I'm going to use, I'm going to talk about the probability say, of the first ball. And I'm going to use something called a probability table. Okay. In that probability table, I will indicate what the random variable is, which values it can take, red or blue, <coughs> and the values that it can take. So in this case, there are three red balls. If there are three bo red balls, the probability of getting a red is three quarters, and the probability for blue is a quarter, as we've seen already before. 
We can also talk about the probability of the second ball given the first ball. We've done this before, but now we're just doing it with a slightly different notation. So the first ball can be red or blue, and the second ball can be red or blue. Okay. If the first ball was red, okay, what's the probability of the second ball being red? Okay, so we've done this before. If the first ball was blue, the probability of it being red is 1. If it was blue, it cannot be blue again because there's only one blue ball. Okay, so that gives you the conditional uh, probability. And we also already did the joint, which by the way, I haven't said this, but I think you probably have to fix this up, that the order doesn't matter. P of A and B is the same as P of B and A. Again, I'm going to have for the joint P1 and P2, things can be red or blue. Okay. Now, what's the probability of the first two balls being red? For the first two balls being red, well, it must be that the first one was red and that the second one was then red. So we have 3 quarters times 2 thirds, which gives us a half. Now, if the first ball um, was blue, the probability that the second ball will be blue is zero. So blue to blue is zero. And if the first ball is red and the next one is blue, so we have this case red blue, okay, red going to blue, so we'll have three quarters times one third, which is one quarter, and then you can check that the next one is also one quarter. Now, what's interesting about these tables, when you eye a table, just by looking at it, you should know whether it's a joint probability or a conditional probability. The conditional probability, <coughs> note that it's rows sum to one. For the joint probabilities, all the numbers sum to 1. So we have a quarter plus a quarter plus a half, giving you a 1. <coughs> Alright, so th these are basically um, all the distributions that we need to talk about. There's the marginals, the conditionals, and the joints. Um, and it's useful to talk, you know, talk about them in terms of tables as opposed to individual values. And that's because if we have tables, we can code them as matrices, and we can do all sorts of fast manipulation in the computers. We will also introduce a graphic notation. In this graphic notation, the two variables will be nodes, and there's going to be an edge indicating the influence of one variable on the other. If your first ball is blue, it affects what the next ball will be, right? Because it can no longer be blue. And the same is true for it was red. So the value of the ball blue 1 influences the value of the ball blue 2. And we describe this with a graph. The nice thing about describing this with a graph is that there are very nice tools out there that allow you to actually draw graphical models. You just draw the graph. And then you say what each variable is, like what's the probability of each variable in a nice GUI. And then these packages do all the computations for you. Basically what you're going to learn to do in this course, um, you will be able to do with some very nice software out there. Now let's be a bit, um, now let's introduce the concept of a Bayesian network for a directed uh, graph model. And now we're getting into bigger models. In particular, the new, this model that I'm introducing here has five variables. 
I will first define what it is, and then I will argue why this is very useful. Okay, so all the variables, which are things in the world, like earthquakes and burglaries and radios and alarms and calls, um, these are all assumed to be binary variables. So the setting is, if you want to think of this in terms of influence, you can think of, and this was, by the way, Judy Pearl, um, um, an exceptional individual who got the Turing Award this year, um, lives in LA, he teaches at the University of California in LA, and he came up with this example. These are sort of the variables that matter if you live in um, LA. Um, there's earthquakes and there's burglaries, and, and if you get an alarm being one, you need to know was that an earthquake or a burglary. And that depends on whether the radio is saying whether there was an earthquake or not. Okay, so we'll get into this example and we'll see how um, Julia used it to introduce this model. <laughs> Judith Pearl, by the way, will be here in, I think in a month or two, giving a talk. And this is very, uh, actually not in this room, uh, but he's part of the UBC Distinguished Lecture Series uh, this term. Okay, so in a directed um, a graphical model or a base name is a directed a cyclic graph. By a cyclic means that there's no cycles. You don't get say variable one pointing to two, two to three, and then three back to two. Okay, that's not a one. Um, and it's directed because there's going to be edges with arrows that indicate what influences what. The edges denote influence. The edges basically denote uh, dependence. They don't, if this is statistical dependence, this does not mean causation. There's a slight, there's an important difference here. Um, if you observe that two things always occur, that doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. Okay? There's common mistake, especially when you read news articles that, you know, this is a really bad neighborhood, there's a lot of, um, I don't know, Portuguese people in this neighborhood, therefore it must be that Portuguese people are gangsters. Um, yeah. Um, so, and this is actually quite common, this type of inference. And a, a, a lot of racism and so on actually stems from this. In Vancouver I hear this all the time, Asians are terrible drivers because every time there's an accident there's an Asian person there. And uh, I've contested this at parties and actually ruined the particular party once because of this. But um, you've got to be very careful with not confounding uh, correlations with causation. Because otherwise you actually do make awful um, potentially harmful collisions. Uh, I'm going to give you an example which hopefully will allow you to always remember this. Um, oh, I've heard this many times. Um, imagine that the human race vanishes, okay, for whatever reason. Okay? Whether it's, I don't know, fires, whatever. Um, and in 200 years or so, an alien species comes to Earth and they encounter this device and with an arrow. Okay. And they organize an expedition and they send a bunch of aliens <coughs> to follow this arrow and come back and tell them what they find when they follow this arrow. So this group of aliens goes, a few months later they're back with a polar bear. Okay. We found a polar bear. <laughs> of course, these are smart aliens, so they'd go like, let's send another team. Don't trust this team. They send another team. Weeks go by. These guys now know how to navigate a bit better. They come back with a polar bear. And, you know, very tough alien boss says, I don't believe this until you do it ten times. So they do this ten times, and every time they come back, there's a polar bear. <laughs> and what scientist proposes, this device here points to polar bears. There's a polar bear pointing. That's statistical causation, okay? Every time you observe the arrow this way, you followed it, and there was a bear. So what happened to them? How can we refute this theory? Um, a smart alien says, wait. 
How about you put a polar bear in front of you and one behind you? Okay, this is called an intervention or an experiment. Oh, it points to that bear, but not to that bear. And then the other alien will go and say, Oh, you silly scientist, of course, that one's got a small paw. <laughs> and you do another experiment, you swap the bears. And it's still pointing to that. And so then they conclude, it's not a polar bear pointing. Okay, the moral of the story is, if you want to get causation, you need to do more work. We're not going to address that in this course. That in itself is a very interesting topic, and I think Judy Pro will be talking about it. Um, does it matter in real life? Yes, a lot. In the consumer world that we live in, uh, one of the biggest applications of computer science is checking whether someone's going to consume your ad or not. And so you always ask this question, what if we had shown this other app? Would they have clicked on it? Okay, so we do experiments with people to see what they are likely to buy for consumers. All right, so with that, um, let's get back to the uh, syntactic of these graphs. So we have nodes, the variables, edges indicate influence. You can sort of think of them as soft causation, but of course, do not think of them as true possession. Um, and the rule here is that a variable is independent of all its ancestors given their parents. Given my parents, I no longer depend on my grandparents. Given the genetic material of my mom and my dad, I don't need to know about the genetic material of my grandparents to know my genetic material. Okay, because everything went through my dad and my mom. Information could have not propagated in the air into my genes. Okay. So, what we do is essentially what's in this picture. If we have a joint distribution of our five variables, and what I'm doing here, I'm using a B to indicate burglary. E is for earthquake, A is for alarm, R is for radio, and C is for call. So, so if you use the, the rules of probability, the chain rule, you could just write the full chain rule and that's basically what you would have in the second line. You'd have probability of B, E given B, and so on. And of course, as you know, there's more than one way to write the chain rule. The order is arbitrary. What is, however, clear is that E, using our definition, E has no parents, so you have to draw B. <coughs> R only has one parent, which is E. So you have to draw these guys. And likewise, C only has one parent, which is A. So you draw the other variables. So then the model simplifies to something that's much smaller. Okay. That is essentially what we use these semantics. We get smaller models. In the rest of the class, I will give you other intuitions as to why we care about these small models. Okay, so if you, and let's sort of go a bit more abstract now. Let's assume that we have n variables, where n could be a very large number. The joint distribution of those n variables, and I will use the notation x1 to n to indicate all the variables. It's just a product from 1 to n of the probability of each variable given its parents. That is the factorization we use. Full probability is described in terms of the product of the variables given the parents. That's the definition. Does that mind that you also report this um, probability of A given B and E? You could have just said probability of A given B and E, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. The order, yeah. when I condition on evidence, it doesn't matter what the order is. 
These are good questions. I mean, I'm being loose with my manipulation of probability. If all these statements would require me to be very rigorous, and in fact, it could be so rigorous that I could teach a whole course just on that. But we're not going to go into that detail. Or that doesn't matter. Okay, so that's the definition. Very, very important. So this one I'm going to start here. Variable given is parents. Now, is it a good model? Is it good to assume all the, to drop all these edges? Um, that will depend on how well that model predicts real life. If this always tells <coughs> Judy and Pearl that there is a burglary and every time he goes home everything is fine and there was only a minor earthquake, uh, then eventually Judy starts thinking, you know what, this model is lousy, I'm going to replace it by another model. Now, here is the advantage of this. The joint distribution, if we have, uh, say, four variables, as we've seen before, requires uh, 15 numbers to represent. However, if you have some information about the problem, in particular, let's assume that my variables now denote some sort of event in the world, whether things are cloudy, whether it rains, Cloudy also often gets your sprinkler going, or I don't know what reason. And the grass gets wet when there's either the sprinkler is on or when there's rain. Now, in order to discuss, to define the probability of cloudy, and again, I emphasize that I'm only doing binary variables for now, but for simplicity. Now, the probability of cloudy, um, I don't know, you just come up with two numbers that describe it. Um, for now, I'm just coming up with these numbers. Um, soon, the topic of one lecture will be where do these numbers come from. But for now, let's assume someone's given, given us these numbers. Then we talk about what's the probability um, of the sprinkler being, being off or on, depending on whether it's cloudy or not. So that's a conditional probability uh, table, just like wall 2 given wall 1. Now, how many parameters do I need in total to describe that model? Fifteen. Fifteen? So here it's clear that I need fifteen. Okay. So Sixteen minus oh. one. And over here, to represent <laughs> this model, I need a table which is P of C. I need this table which is P of W given R and S. I need this table which is P of R given C. And I need this table which is P of S given C. So I need these four tables to describe the problem. Because the joint factorizes precisely in those four tables. So if the probability of variable given its parents, P of C, C has no parent, sprinkler has one parent, so we have sprinkler given C. <coughs> Wet grass has two parents, so we, so we observe P of W given S and R. Why is it probably there? Why isn't it probably of wet grass given S, R, and C? Since is it only the direct parents or are you asking? Wait, I'm not following the question. Can you repeat? Uh, in the last slide, when the last term had um, not, I think it just it didn't have just the direct parents. It had all the other variables upstream. It was conditional. And oh. here, the probability of <coughs> W. Not quite. Again, a variable okay. given its parents. given its parents. That's the definition. Whether that's a good model or not, that's something we will answer later. But for now, let's just learn the syntax. So let's assume we're just happy with this. It's a product of variable given the parents. And let's assume that this drawing is something that you come up with. So you want to see, huh, what influences my mark? There's my girlfriend here. There's <coughs> one of my mom makes me study. There's um, party. There's studying, 
and then there's all these binary variables, and then this is my mark, and they all point to it. And then you try, well, let's assume that someone, an expert, drew this graph. Later we will learn how to automatically infer such graphs from data. But for now, let's assume an expert has given us this graph. So then the question is, how many parameters do I need on the right hand side to fully describe that model? Nine? Nine. Because okay. I basically need the following parameters. I need this. I don't need the other number because I know that this must sum to 1. If this distribution sums to 1, it must be that the other one is 0.5. I need these two numbers. I don't need the other two because the other two just ensure that the conditional probability sums to 1. I need these two numbers and I need these four. So we have 4 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1, 9 parameters. So the take home message is that it's a more succinct representation. It requires less numbers, it requires less memory. Now, if you have a hundred variables, we said it's 2 to the d minus 1. It's 2 to the power 100. Okay? Who's got a calculator and computer? Just try 2 to the 100. Problems with 1,000 variables are not outside our reach. You would think if we can't do 1,000 variables, then this whole theory is pointless. But 2 to the 1,000 will kill us. Does anyone want to compute 2 to the 1,000 in your machines? I think 2 to the 1,000 is about 10 to the 300. Yeah. yeah. So that's a lot of flops. It's many times a lot, a lot of storage. So you're not going to solve this problem by buying better computers or by uh, using all the cloud storage in this cloud. Um, you're only going to solve it by coming up with good models and by being able to come up with uh, ways of learning these models from data. Now here's some examples of these models. Uh, one example um, is this vehicle insurance where you know, some expert drew this graph and they've put in probabilities and then when you have an accident happens um, you know, you might want to try to confirm how good is the driver or, you, or if you're an insurance company you might want to predict um, you know, how safe is your investment on this new driver what should be the premium for this driver what's the risk of an accident for this driver Another example is, you know, diagnosis in printers, uh, in this case, a Microsoft printer. Xerox does this too in, the, in their photocopy machines. Um, often something goes wrong with the printer and the printer tells you where to, what to do to fix it. We, we all hate that experience. Blame the space in network for, for that. <laughs> Um, here is another sort of problem that shows how you could have many aircraft flying and there's different radar events and you're trying to infer something about um, the plane traffic. Um, you might have a bunch of genes, they're all interconnected to each other. Uh, these graphs you typically learn them directly from data. And what you might want to answer is a question like, if these two genes are active, What's the probability that this other chain will also be out? Okay, this sort of questions are very useful for you know, the design of drugs. Being able to detect uh, you know, cyber crimes, intruder detection and so on. There's examples out there where people do that. Um, people use this to not only in these sort of science applications, but also say when they get together people from um, with different interests, like farmers and people in, in, interested in environmental monitoring and people interested in sustainability, and they each care about a set of variables. All these variables depend one on the other. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty out there because you don't get to observe everything. People like steel water, you don't get to observe that, and you still have to make inferences as to what should be the level of the dam 
because so you have to marginalize over someone stealing water so that you ensure that there's a smooth flow and so that there's no, um, say, sudden changes in the water level. Because in BC, if you have sudden changes in the water level, what happens is <coughs> pools get formed on the edge of the dams of the, uh, um, and then of the lakes. And then if the salmon go and, you know, to the baby salmon go to the shore, and then the water drops suddenly, and then the little pools dry, and all the baby fish die as a result. So if you want to actually do a lot of fisheries and so on in BC, you need to actually care about building these huge models to know exactly what's going on in the environment. And also if you want to change a policy, you want to change the value of one node and see how it affects all the other nodes. And you want to be able to communicate that to a large number of people in a nice, clear, graphical interface. The, the fish thing actually is, is something that I worked on as a consulting job. It's, it's a problem that arises. Uh, I just had a question. The parents of the variable, in that slide, they were static. The previous slide, there was, uh, if you had a fixed number of parents, what if that situation was not the case? Like how would you have to design your algorithm. Say you're writing an algorithm and the parents, there's probably four variables and then over time it's five and six and three or four changes. topic. Five, four. We, we do address those uh, issues of like, uh, when you, more generally, if you do it, sometimes you, there's, you don't know what the variable is, but you might also not know how many variables are there in the problem. And we actually do have tools for doing that. The tools build on what we do in this course, but I will not get into it. Maybe not because of con it being hard conceptually, but the computation is hard. So we need to invent other algorithms. Flash. So th in particular, this website in France, uh, Bayesia.com, They've got a bunch of applications. One of them is marketing of perfume. And they built this huge graph. If you go to this website, you can see the whole report as to how they use these graphs in fashion and so on. And this, by the way, um, I really mean it by the main application of most of the stuff that we're going to cover in this course is really marketing. Okay. And marketing is very big in fashion. So companies like, even here in Vancouver, companies like Lululemon do invest a lot of money into being able to actually have you know, effective marketing campaigns. Um, I think most small companies are still not very smart into how to do it properly. They don't have the machine learning tools. Um, you guys will be graduating in a year or so. You'll be in a really good position to actually make changes. And definitely the market is huge. Just look at Pinterest. Are we also assuming there's no cycles in the graphs, like entering That's true. No cycles. There's other types of graphs, but I will not cover this. We're only going to do these class of graphs, which is generally enough that would allow us to do a lot of cool stuff. Like, for example, this. OK, so those are some examples of where you can apply this. Um, so one benefit of the probabilistic graphical models so far is that they allow us to um, talk about many variables uh, but without having to store too many parameters. Okay, so that we get sparse representations. The other thing that they're good for is that a node is independent of the rest of the node given a subset of the node. It will turn out that a node will be independent of everything else, just given its children, its, um, I guess, partners, and a node can have more than one partner, and the parents. So given the parents, the children, and the partners, you're independent of the rest. And that actually is very important for artificial intelligence, and it's one of the reasons why Julia Pearls got just a Turing Award. Um, because it's, you can arrive at the conclusion about something happening <coughs> without having to think about everything else. And that sort of local computation is essential in order to be able to actually do this in real uh, applications. So 
understand that, it helps to do three small examples. And the three small examples are as follows. And I, I like to illustrate these first with sort of toy examples. Okay, let's assume that we have the variables clouding. Cloudy influences rain, and rain influences that you get wet. So the probability for this model would be P of C times P of R given C times P of W given R. Now, let's assume that you observe that it's raining. So the graph is saying, when it's cloudy, it rains, and you're outside, you get wet. Okay. Let's assume that you're outside, and you know it's raining. Do you need to know if it's cloudy to know that you're wet? No, not red. And so we say that formally W is independent of C given R. This symbol here means independent. And this symbol here is our usual given symbol. That's the rule. Um, the second rule. Sorry, Nick. So, do you mean that W is independent of C, given that R is true? Given versus R. W is independent. Or of given that R is false, just given R. So, assume that you're outside and it's not okay. rain. Do you need to know if it's cloudy to know whether it's rain? Good okay. okay, let's look at another case that is easy. If it rains, and it's awesome that it hasn't rained in a long time. If it rains, you get wet, or you get sad, I get sad. Okay, so the model for this would be P of R, P of C given R, and then P of S given R. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, sorry, this is a wet, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so in this case, if it's raining, do you need to know if you're wet in order to know that you're sad? <coughs> Actually, that's a bad example. Let's flip, flip it around. <laughs> Basically, this is a no. If it rains, you get sad. And if it rains, you also get wet. If, if you're wet, you don't need to know if it's raining for you to be sad. You know, rain causes you to be sad, whether you're outside or indoors. Okay. Likewise, um, if you're sad, so if it's raining, you know you'll be wet. If it's raining and you're outside, this is probably a better way to see it. If you're outside and it's raining, you can figure out that you're wet. You don't need to consult your brain and, am I sad? <laughs> no, you'll be wet because it's rain. So, W is independent <coughs> of S given R. And I, again, I'm going to shape that R to indicate that it's been observed. Okay, so I shape a node to indicate that the node has been observed. Then it's given. Its value is not. Why do you Whether it's zero or R? Pardon? Why do you need given R here? Okay. So I'm, what I'm doing is three examples, and then I will argue that these three examples are all the examples that will arise every practice. Okay, so bear with me, one more example, and then I will illustrate that those are all the examples we need. So we have multiple children, a chain, and then the other thing that we're missing is incoming links. So when you have two parents. So going ahead, 
we're going to have this situation where a guy X will depend on its parents, its children, and its children's parents. Okay, so those are the cases. If we address those three cases, we address all the possible connectivity that I know could happen in ground. Okay, so very quickly to finish today, let's assume that rain or shower calls you to be wet. Now, let's assume you're wet. In order to know whether it's raining or not, does it, is it helpful to know whether you're in the shower? Yes. Yes. You're wet and you're in the shower, then it might or might not be rain. But if you're not in the shower, and you're wet, and it's probably because you're outside. Okay. So, R is not independent of S given dot. Good way to remember this, once you have children, you'll never be independent of your other partner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, those are the three rules. Next, in the next class, I will finish the, the example in the next slide. And I will illustrate that you only need to know your parents, children, and partners in order to know everything about a program in the next slide. Yeah, I